Well, good evening. Um, as you heard, I'm uh, Professor Matthew Todd at uh, UCL. I'm a professor of drug discovery. So I'm interested in um, discovering new medicines for the, to treat the diseases that we most need. Uh, I'm interested in doing that in different ways. So besides just getting the medicines, I'm also interested in how we go about doing that. Now, many people will be aware that there are a couple of big problems with the medicines that are available to us. Um, often they don't exist, so there are lots of diseases where there are no medicines at all. Um, and there are other cases where the medicines are available, but they are extremely expensive. So these are big problems that we all know about, I think. Um, I think there is a solution, um, and I think during this talk, I'll convince you at the beginning that the problem that we've got to solve is one of secrecy. And then in the middle of the talk, you'll realize it's not secrecy. Uh, the problem is economics. And then at the end of the talk, hopefully you'll realize that the solution to it all is just a piece of paper. That's the plan. We'll see if it works. OK, so the, um, the first thing I want to talk about, if we want to get started, is how we do stuff in our lives. So if you think about how you do things, um, generally there's two ways of doing stuff, I think. One is that you work on your own in secret in a, in a room and you do stuff yourself. And you can craft something personal or, or, or do something that, where you enjoy the activity, like writing something or composing something. It's one of the reasons why we academics always insist on having doors in our offices so we can sit there and do things ourselves. But in, and, and you can do amazing things that way, no question about it. But there's another way of doing things where, for, in many cases, there's a better solution to solving problems. And that is being social, working together, seeing what other people are doing, and watching and observing. There is no faster way of learning how to do something than watching somebody else try and do it, particularly if they do it badly or well. Uh, and we, we learn this, I think, as children. And I think we forget about it because as we get old, we become proud and we think we should be able to do things ourselves. But it's incredibly fast, right? So there's, there's two general ways. One is where there's a wall maybe around a, a group of you or something, and one is much more open where you're being a, a social animal and interacting with each other. Okay, now we actually know all this already. Um, so there are two ways of working which are quite well codified, and the, the closed one has given rise to amazing things. So Britannica, the Encyclopedia Britannica was made by a closed system. You, know, you weren't involved, the public weren't involved. You can't go and change Britannica now. It was made by a, a structure of people, highly trained people, lots of money, where people at the top directed people at the bottom, a sort of pyramid of expertise. And, and cathedrals were made this way, right? So people, there was a very rigid structure in place. And it's called the cathedral model of production behind a closed door. Now, half of us in this room, maybe, I don't know, use iPhones. And the operating system in the iPhone is like this. It's the iOS operating system. It's proprietary. It's closed. You can't change it. The other way um, is a more open way, right, a more social way. Um, where anybody can take part. So there's no wall. You can wander in and do stuff. You can see it all. You can change stuff. And Wikipedia is like this. Right? So now in this room, if you wanted to, you could go to Wikipedia and change the entry for Seven Oaks School, write something rude. Okay? You're allowed to do that. It's an open system. It's open source in a sense because you can see everything. Um, the other half of people in the room uh, use, probably use Android phones. The Android operating system is open source. You can see it, you can change it if you want to, if you were skilled enough to do that. You could change it if you wanted to. It's open source. This is called the bazaar, not the bizarre, a bazaar model, like a market. So it has this, this resemblance to a market, which is a space, and anyone can sort of rock up and do things. And it's a little chaotic, right? Um, maybe it smells a little bit, right? But it's a good way to solve the problem. You can go in and sell things. And it sort of self-assembles, and there's fewer overheads. It's cheaper. It's faster. So there are two ways of doing it, closed and open. Both have given rise to market-leading products, like um, Android and, and the Apple's operating system. Market-leading, big. Not niche. These are big things. But there are two distinct ways of operating. One is closed, and one is open. So <clears throat> does the same competition of ideas exist, closed versus open, exist in the discovery of new medicines? No. It's very interesting. All the medicines you take, apart from maybe a few exceptions, all the medicines you take have been discovered and developed in secret with the closed system. Isn't that strange? So why is that? Well, there are lots of reasons. Um, 
There are like 2.6 billion reasons, actually. There are some estimates that say that developing a new medicine from start to market takes $2.5 billion, roughly. And so if you're thinking about numbers like that, um, people need to invest in that. And if they're going to invest in that, they want a return. So if you invest in new drugs, you want a return on your investment. But more than that, if you're investing billions, you want a profit. No question about it, you want a profit. So this closed system which operates uh, is doing this because of the way in which you guarantee a profit. The way you guarantee a profit is through the patent system. You do some work, you patent it, and then you make money back at the end. That's the whole system. The issue with that is, and, and it works very well, in the sense that many medicines have come through, but there is only one, one system and it's closed. And so you, you have this situation where everybody has to do the research using the patent system. You can't patent something if you've already talked about it. So if I stand here and I reveal, well, like Ali's design, if, if I stand here and I reveal something to you in public, I can't then patent it and, and own the intellectual property if I speak about it in public. So all the research that leads to medicines has to be secret so that you can use the patent system to get your money back. It seems a shame, right? Because you poison the openness of the research cycle. <clears throat> this is the system we have. It's the only system we have, pretty much. And as a result, we have this slightly unhealthy reliance on the pharmaceutical industry to generate the medicines we need. If they can't or won't act, the medicines don't exist. Um, medicines for Alzheimer's, there are no, really, there are, there are no disease-curing, disease-modifying medicines for Alzheimer's. Pharmaceutical industry is getting out of antibiotics. There are no new antibiotics coming through from the pharmaceutical industry. Well, there are fewer. There are fewer than there should be. Many companies are getting out of that area um, because they don't see a way to guarantee the profit. Um, there are lots of diseases, of many diseases of the, of, the, of the developing world. There's no profit to be made, so no company is going to make medicines in those areas. So we have this system where, because of the economic model we have, which ruins the, secret, which ruins the effectiveness of the research, in my view, we don't have lots of drugs coming through, unfortunately, because we have this reliance on this one system, the cathedral model, essentially, of getting new medicines. Uh, what about the bizarre model? Can we use the bizarre model to get new medicines? Well, a project I started a few years ago called Open Source Malaria is trying this out. These are the rules. We're trying to develop new medicines to treat malaria, a big killer around the world. The first three rules are very important. All data and ideas are shared in real time. So you can see everything in real time. The lab notebooks are online. You can see what we're doing every day. Second one is that anybody, anybody can take part. And third one, no patents, to make it very clear. We're not doing the patent way of generating medicines. The others are about um, ways of behaving. So you can't use email. Um, don't be an asshole, which is the fifth one. And the, the sixth one is no one owns it, right? So you can take part and therefore be part of it, but no one owns it. <clears throat> so this is called open source malaria. Does it work? Um, yes, it does. It's really fun, first of all. But secondly, the thing which happens when you make it open, a bit like Wikipedia, all these people start contributing. And it's not just people with nothing to do, right? It's people who know what they're doing. Like, like students know what they're doing, they contribute. Uh, Ex-members of the pharmaceutical industry contribute current members of the pharmaceutical industry contribute, and they contribute, and they contribute. People give to things like this. Um, so yes, it works. We're not nearly at the point of getting a medicine to treat malaria. We have a medicine that works in an animal, but it's not quite, just quite ready yet to test in a person. But it's getting closer. It's getting closer. And it's very exciting to do things this way. One of the nice things about it is that you can uh, work with uh, students to um, progress things. It's uh, very good for crowdsourcing. We've worked with many student groups around the world to crowdsource the synthesis of medicines. Uh, and it works really well. It works really well because everyone can see everything. So you learn from what other people are doing. And you may have heard of us about a year and a half ago. We were involved in a project um, involving a, a medicine that was quite controversial. There was this medicine that's used to treat malaria and something called toxoplasmosis. Um, very common medicine called Daraprim, and it was available very cheaply. Uh, because of a legal loophole, a guy called Martin Shkreli, who worked at Turing Pharmaceuticals, purchased the rights for this medicine, the exclusive rights for this medicine. And overnight, raised the price of this medicine by 5,500%. And there was fury around the world. And we were angry, too. We worked with some students, the age of many of you in the audience, um, in a school in Sydney, in Australia, Sydney Grammar School. With their dedicated teachers, they made this medicine in their own lab before and after school in their spare time. And we worked with them using the open platform so that everyone could see what they were doing and they had advice coming in from people. 
they made this medicine. And the, the picture I love is the one that's up there of one of the students holding up the vial of medicine, which they made primo grade daraprim, by the way, absolutely pure. It's amazing. Really good effort they made. Um, they made it, and the, the value of that medicine is holding up is $150,000. It's obscene, right? And so this went viral because people thought this is outrageous. And we were on The Daily Show, this funny thing, um, The Daily Show in, in the US, because people are really angry about the price of medicine. So why should it be so expensive? Um, the project was fun as an educational project, but we did it also to try to show to people that the reason why medicines are expensive is nothing to do with the fact that they're hard to make. There's other reasons for that. So it's fun to do that, um, and, and we want to do more of that. We just got some money from Google to run this Breaking Good project, which is trying to work with schools around the world to make new medicines, right? So doing real research medicines uh, in the same way. All right, so um, back to the, 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 main, the main thing. Um, we currently have this, this better way of doing things, of working openly, and you work with people, and you see what they're doing, and you can learn from each other, and we want to use that to make new medicines, but we can't do because of the patent system. So we can't do it because it has to be secretive. So the money problem there gets in the way of the sharing and prevents us from doing things. And that's what we're trying to solve. So what you really want to do is solve that problem. What you want to do is think, well, is there a way that we could work openly and share everything and learn from each other in this very inclusive way and still make it economic sense, still make money back? Is there a way of doing that? I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, because it's a hard one, it's a hard one, because we, all the medicines we take are, are not like this. <clears throat> well, it turns out, uh, as I was looking into this, it turns out I have family history on this exact question, which surprised me. Uh, I am apparently related to this guy on the right called Samuel Crompton, who was a pioneer of the Industrial Revolution. I say apparently because it's like a gap in the family tree, we're not quite sure it matches up, but apparently there's a statue of this guy in Bolton who looks exactly like my granddad, says my mum. All right. This is my evidence building up as a relationship. But he was a pioneer. He invented something called a spinning mule, which was a, this device shown, which made very beautiful, fine cloth. It could spin thread very finely. And he made this thing and in his house. He had it in his house. And from his house came all these wonderful cloths. And people thought, how on earth is he doing this? How is he making these wonderful cloths? Because it's very important. Textile industry was very small back then. Um, and so they tried to sort of get in the house to see it. They sort of came and said, hi, Sam, you know, how are you doing? Can I have a cup of tea or something? And they wanted to sort of come in and look at the machine because it was hidden in his house. And they tried to, to see it by all means. There was a guy who went up to his attic and drilled holes in the floor so he could peer in and have a look at the machine in the, in the, in the room below. It was crazy. And he was getting completely stressed out by all this constant pressure, and he just wanted to work. He wasn't rich enough to take a patent out. He couldn't afford it. So he, he reached an agreement with all of these people saying, OK, I'll reveal to you what I did this machine, if you just give me a little bit of money in, in return. And they said, yeah, great, no problem. And so he revealed the machine, the workings of the machine, and no one gave him anything. The design then spread like wildfire. Innovation in the textile industry flooded the country, and it was a big part of the Industrial Revolution. He was very poor. Uh, years later, his case was discussed in the Houses of Parliament, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer gave him 6,000 pounds, which was a pittance back then. It was a pittance. pittance now for what he did, but it's a pittance at the time. But it exemplifies the point that if you could only get like an agreement, like a piece of paper that said, OK, you invented this thing, and it works, and it's amazing. You invented this thing, so we'll give you a reward if it's working as well as you say it's going to work. It exemplifies that point. You invent something, you share what you did, it makes a big difference to society, and then after the fact, you get a reward back. Right, that, that's the pattern. That's the pattern. So could we do that? Could we then work together openly, open source, right? Share everything, make the medicine, make sure it works, and then at the end, get the money back somehow. Re you know, reward the innovators. Reward the people who invested in the first place. That's what you want to do. You want to try and somehow, they, at the end of it, get the money back somehow. Um, yes, you can do that. You can do this. You know how I know? Because it exists already. We can do this already. There's a system that, that operates that will allow us to do this. Why haven't we done it then? Because there's never been an open source medicine before. No one has ever taken a molecule from public domain all the way through to market with no secrecy. No one has ever done that. But there's a system in place already. <clears throat> it's called um, exclusivity. So uh, if you take a drug to market, uh, you, you can use the patent system. 
Or, and sometime at the same time, you can also get a reward for the trouble of taking it through. So if I pay all this money to take a medicine through, I already now get a piece of paper from the government that says, hey, you know what, thanks, that's amazing. Here's five or 10 years, and you can sell the drug at whatever price you want. We already get that. Lots of these drugs get 5 or 10% or whatever for, for a period where you can set the drug price whatever you want and you don't get any competition. It's called de regulatory data exclusivity, but we don't have to worry about it too much. The, the point is that it already exists. We can use this already to do this. And uh, the idea then would be that you, you do your research openly um, and you try and get your drug. Will it be a good drug? Well, yes, it's going to be a good drug because you've got like 7 billion pairs of eyes looking at it. And there's no way of hiding bad data. So the drug's going to be really good. It then goes all the way through to market, uh, and then you get this piece of paper from the government that says, OK, sure, here's your exclusivity. As per usual, here's your exclusivity. And we set the price of the medicine really low, so it's affordable. And then after a few years, after you've made your money back, it goes generic, and anybody can make it. It should work. It's, got a, it's, got a, it's an existing system. I think so. I'm extremely fortunate to work with some other people, uh, other very smart people who also think so. Uh, and we should do this. We should do this, people, right? It's going to work. Uh, why aren't we doing it already? Well, we are a minority view. Um, it's one of the situations where you're a very small group, but you know you're right, but you're a very small group. And the problem is we don't have a precedent yet. And if you want to get the precedent, you've got to have people to invest in it in the first place. But the investors are nervous because there's no precedent. And you need the precedent. To, it's this vicious cycle, unfortunately, as always. But you know what? If we want the medicines that we really need, and um, we want to use this approach to get medicines that are inexpensive, we're going to have to work pretty hard to break the, this precedent that we see of drugs that are only ever being developed with secretive methods. You know what? Also, as our illustrious Speaker of the House said just last week, <clears throat> If we were guided only by precedent, manifestly nothing in our procedures would ever change. Thank you.